Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is Folk Magic of the Haven Isles for the Midlands by Monkey Blood Design. Okay, first a bit of history. Kickstarted in June 2020 and completely delivered by July 2020, Folk Magic of the Haven Isles is a 58-page supplement for the Midlands setting for magical types of the Haven Isles, inspired by real British folklore and is an OSR supplement that is compatible with swords and wizardry. It is available as a softback, hardback and PDF. To the cover. Though there isn't much art to speak of, I do feel that this is nicely done and it does well to set the mood of the book with the muted greens and browns and I actually really quite like it. On to the inside. Once we get past the array of credits we hit the introduction where it talks about the odd idiosyncratic folk magic of the British Isles and how this supplement takes them and warps them into a more unified shape. It explains that the classes presented within are designed to be overlaid on top of a classic magic user class. Think kits from AD&D, with each one having advantages and disadvantages, and having the idea that they present something interesting to play that is a weird escape from the norm. The first is the Apple Queen or King. These are mystical cider brewers who can brew drafts that are infused with one of their memorised spells. If they consume an apple or something apple related daily, then they get a bonus to their con and hit points, with the downside being that if they don't, they can't cast spells. They have a number of unique spells which are detailed later on in the book. I'll talk about them in a bit. Each of these classes has a bit of flavour that can be added to them. For example, the Apple Queen or King can have spells that conjure the smells of apple blossom or rich earth. It also suggests that you could have essentially a beer queen or king by substituting the apples for hops, and suggests that this subclass could potentially be a good fit for druids. The next one is the Bog Chanter, filthy, fettered magic users that use their power of mud, swamps and marshes to conjure effects. They have the ability to not sink into mud or water if they wish, and they cannot drown in the lakes of marshes. A downside is that they leave muddy footprints and handprints everywhere, and have to actively concentrate in order to not do so. Additionally, they must be buried in a bog or marsh or they will rise as a vengeful bog mummy. They normally like necromantic spells, and when they cast spells they sound like someone being drowned in mud. Undead summoned by them will be mud-soaked corpses or spectral clouds of marsh gas, and hold spells they use will manifest as animated mud. After this is the Brag. These bizarre magical users can turn into a donkey and are usually goblins, though they can be human. They cannot be lawful, and they do not need to sleep provided they have disturbed someone else's. Also, while in donkey form, they can move incredibly quickly and have a savage kick, though there is a 1 in 20 chance that they will be stuck in this form for the next day. As they are part fairy, cold iron burns them, and the sound of church bells drives them into a frenzy, as well as the fact that they can't break a promise. They cast spells by screaming, braying and howling, and they are usually themed around shapeshifting, darkness and trickery. We then have the Demon Slave. These are magic users that have made pacts with devils and demons to gain power and wealth. They are chaotic in alignment, and have a minor demon familiar that feeds on their life force, and this familiar is not under their control. They develop a witch mark where the familiar feeds from them and can be summoned to a hellish festival at certain times of the year where unimaginable things are done to them, but where they can gain a boon from their patron. The words to their spells are demonic and may burn the air, curdle milk or conjure the smell of brimstone. After this we have the fairy bride or bridegroom. These are mortals that have spent large periods of time in the fairy realm, which gives them a strange view of humanity, but also grants them an ingrained understanding of magic. They don't use spell books and hold the magic in their minds like a song, as well as using charisma instead of int for determining maximum spell level and the like. They can always find one of the unfair folk, though they can always find them back, and in return they do not return from the fairy realms unmarked. They had to roll an improvement and experience on these tables here. They sing songs to cast their spells, and they tend to be full of illusion and spectacle, with bursts of sparks and flashing lights everywhere. Following this we have the Green Child. These are said to be children who are raised deep in the middle gloom that make their way to the surface and become magicians. They start as the colour of fresh peas, and the colour becomes more apparent as they grow in power, and they gain gloom-touched deformities. Those that spend time with them also eventually gain deformities. They can also smell gloomium and creatures from the upper middle gloom. All of their spells are infused with the colour green, even invisibility, and the names they have for spells are not in human languages, things like Grishgrash, Lollopy Bop and Bonk Bonk Fatan. We have the Hermetic Magician, the secret scholarly type who has the ultimate goal of turning lead into gold. They require various ritual objects in order to use magic and point blank refuse to use quicker methods. They're very knowledgeable with regard to new spells and magic items and can always find others of their kind in most civilised societies. They rely on complex formulae to cast spells and use odd ritual objects to enact the effect. 
After this, we have the Masked Dancer. These magic users gain their power from wearing particular costumes and masks, which have their own benefits and personalities. It then gives us a few examples of Masked Dancers, such as the Dorsum Set Oza, Obby Oss, Morris Paint and Harlequin. They need to use a mask in order to cast spells, and they prance about making strange noises when doing so. Their appearance is reflected in their spells. For example, a horse-based mask dancer like the aforementioned Obios would summon equine monsters. We then have the Pella. These are lawful magicians that serve their community and generally adventure so that they can better do this. Instead of memorising a spell, they can create a witch bottle, which is a defensive ward that protects a specific person. It contains some substance from the protected person, nails, hair, etc. And then the Pella buries it, which subsequently grants the target protection from hostile magic. If the bottle is dug up or broken, the protection is lost. The Pella can't refuse to help a non-hostile creature who asks for aid. Though they can demand a fee and they can't use their magic to harm an innocent, though what actually constitutes innocent is flexible. If they do, they lose their powers until they perform an act of penance. They have access to some clerical spells and can cast spells by using rhymes, burning herbs or drawing charms through their fingers. This is followed by the Sin Eater. These strange magicians take money from the family of dead people to take all of the evil deeds done by them onto themselves. Sin Eaters have an innate ability to know when an NPC will die and regardless of how they conduct themselves they will always appear chaotically aligned and at higher levels can be held back by protecting from evil and turned like undead. They're physically marked by their absorption of sin, looking older and more ill than they should be, though they can easily find work. They have an optional rule whereby they can eat a hostile spell targeted at somebody. They also have access to some clerical spells. We then have the Spay Wife. These predominantly female magic users have power associated with prophecy and weather divination. They need to spend an hour daily using their magic to do the likes of reading dreams, cards and clouds, and once per day they can add their level to a single non-damage roll as they have seen the moment in premonition. Also, they can't drown in salt water. They are the enemy of the Nukalavi, a sea demon of misfortune near the Orkey Isles, and the Spay Wife will use their power to defend these folk. As a result, they attract hostile monsters. After this is the Stitch Witch. These are essentially magical tailors that can not only bond fabric and leather, but also wood, bone and iron. They cast spells through focuses called a poppet by pinning wings on it for fly spells or binding it in string to cast web, for example. They summon scarecrows instead of undead, and their spellbook is a collection of arcane stitches. We then have the Toadman. These strange magicians are made with a fairly complex ritual that causes them to transform into a hunched over figure with huge eyes and able to use magic without ever having learned it. They're immune to all non-magical poisons and are poisonous themselves. They are disliked by humans and amphibians alike and have a lower charisma than normal. They can breathe underwater for short periods and can gain other abilities associated with toads such as subsisting on insects and flies and jumping further than humans. They're very unpleasant to be around and cast spells by throwing bones, spitting and croaking. Their spells are often themed around insects, vermin and amphibians. The final subclass is the Wizard of the Edge. These magic users sometimes wander about finding objects to equip the slumbering order of armoured knights frozen in time, awaiting Havenland's greatest moment of need. Strange events seem to follow them about and they're privy to secrets from the past and future. They employ an archaic magic style that is not often seen. The next section deals with backgrounds. Here it comes up with some interesting and often strange backgrounds for players to pick. Among them is the arcane Gloombugger, a magician that whispers to capture Gloombugs to learn their secrets. The dwarven Shouter, who cast spells by waving their arms and shouting like a very grumpy or drunk old man. The Goblin Stinkbinder, that collects spell books of intricate spells that allow them to memorise them. And the Worm Charmer, who collects worms. All of these are very much flavoured toward the Midland setting and suit it perfectly. There is even a what is weird about this magic user table which can give them a random weirdness. We then have a short section containing some magical tomes, such as What Them Their Angels Told Martha, a book said to hold the wisdom of angels who visited an old woman in Hertia called Martha to tell her their secrets, except she wouldn't let them in, or the Clypeus Maleficarum, a book for witches that tells them how to blend into society, or the Gadda Book, a series of 47 runes originally written on willow bark and translated across the Haven Isles. Copies of this book are usually uncomfortably cold and spread frost if left unopened. We then have a selection of Midlands flavoured spells that are mostly to do with the magic user classes early in the book. Things like spells that create various ciders or dolls, and perhaps the single most British spell I've ever encountered, Enforce Queuing, which forces hostile creatures to form an orderly single file queue when attacking the character or their allies. 
There is also the very valuable Transmute Lead to Gold spell, and a very powerful level 1 spell called Time Skip, which stops a target from acting for an entire round, and the time skips and stutters for them. Finally, we have some oddities such as the Mandrake and the Wizard Hole, that are tiny pocket dimensions that are scattered across the land. Following this, we have some book references, Glossary of Midlands Terms for those who don't own the other books, and the OGL. Folk Magic of the Haven Isles is a flavourful supplement that should provide bucket loads of inspiration for not only your Midlands game, but for probably a fair amount of fantasy games. The writing has the undercurrent of British humour that we've come to expect from the setting, and seeing how frankly crazy British folklore is, translated into something gameable in a clever, witty and thoughtful way, made this an easy read. Indeed, I read it in one sitting and I could have read more. The art is lovely throughout, bringing to mind a disturbing children's book, and as expected, everything is tinged with green and filth, as befits the Haven Isles. The spells are interesting and unique, the magical tomes funny and clever, and things like the Robin Jay breast with their song described as an old man choking on broken glass actually made me burst out laughing as did many things here. Whilst I could have read more, it does feel a tad short of 58 pages, but what you have inside is of really good quality, and perhaps more importantly, usable in-game. This does on all appearances seem to be a book tinged with fluff, when in actuality it has its fair share of crunch for those that enjoy that kind of thing. This is the premium colour hardback of the book, and it does actually feel premium, with a nice sturdy cover and thick glossy pages. I fail to see how anybody could be disappointed with this book, as it has warmth and heart throughout, albeit a barely beating heart clog with gloomium. And once again, the Midlands provides us with great material for is what I already consider a great setting. I give it a 9 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos. Also, if you're interested in buying this product, I'll put some links below. Lastly, if you like what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon. But out.